the work that we've done so far in class on Tanabe Sugano diagrams and terms, that governs the energy of the transitions that we have. So the x-axis of our uh, UV-Vis plot, for example. But the intensity of the absorptions, so the y-axis, like how strongly each band absorbs, depends on, not on the, the energies of the terms themselves, but on selection rules. So these govern band intensities. So intensities, keep in mind, are different than band energies. Intensities. So I'll just draw the little thing. Right here, if you have wavelength and nanometers, oops, nanometers, or energy in inverse centimeters, this is energy. So this is the splitting between your um, you know, ground state and excited states. And then here is absorption, or you might see it in terms of extinction coefficient. And this is going to be the intensity, so the y-axis So for your band, right? energy, intensity. OK. Um, and then so this depends on the properties that matter. So we've talked about, um, we've said something about uh, the so-called F, the oscillator strength. And then this, so this basically is the intensity of reabsorption of the entire band. So if we're integrating across this, this one transition, so this is going to be proportional to when we integrate from you know, the, the boundaries of your band, new one, new two, and then we integrate the extinction coefficient, which is you know, the y-axis here, across your entire band. So the stronger this band absorbs, and also if it's really broad, and that's your oscillator strength, how strongly this transition absorbs. And then uh, this is what you get from your data. But in, from quantum, this is also proportional to this integral. Uh, squared. So these are our different wave functions. So these are the wave functions of our state that you're going from and going to. So for electronic absorption transition, we're going from the ground state, which would be psi 1, to the excited state. And that'd be psi 2. And then so which excited state that is depends on what your term symbol is. And then so we know the are. And then here, this mu is the electric dipole moment operator. And so this is related to you know your light comes in, it's an electromagnetic wave, it's waving up and down, and then it has to you know hit your molecule and they excite that. Um, so the key point to remember for this is that this transforms as gamma x y z because light is a wave, so it can you know oscillate in the z axis, it can oscillate in the x axis, it can oscillate in the y axis. So it's has a sort of linear um, uh, function that it transforms as. And I'm sorry, I meant to say this transforms as, not as proportional to. So this transforms as, this is the symmetry of the electric dipole moment operator. Okay, so in principle, if you want to know what the oscillator strength is, you need to know what your wave functions of your terms are, and that's really hard. So because any wave function is going to be a product of multiple different components, we're going to have our orbital wave function. We might also have our, the spin. Then we also have vibrational. And then we also have rotational and translational. And so for the purposes of what we're talking about today, we'll kind of ignore this. So we need to worry about orbital, spin, and vibrational functions. Um, and so in principle, like, we can't really figure out what these functions are. This is not very easy right? for a multi-electron, multi proton or multi, you know, multi-atom molecule. So, but what we can do is uh, we can figure out the symmetry. So what we know is, this goes back to our discussion from class, is if you want this, uh, there to be a non-zero absorption, this integral has to be greater than 1. Right? So there has to be some integration. And what this means is that when we integrate the function, 
here's a function. Let's say here's kind of like x and y axes of some any function. If the function is symmetric, you get a non-zero integral. If the function is not symmetric, let's say like this, when you integrate this, this is a zero integral. So what you want to think about the orbital component, so this is the critical part, the orbital component. So if we split this up, and then we have the orbital wave function times electrodipole moment operator times the orbital wave function, what this means is that for, the, the, for there to be a non-zero integral, um, then we have to have this property, which is that here's the symmetry, the irreducible representation of our ground state, times the direct product of gamma x, y, z, times the symmetry of your excited state. And then, so as long as this direct product has any component that is a1g in octahedral or a1 if you're in a different point group, then you have basically like a non-zero integral. That's the, the key takeaway. So we can use symmetry to figure out the symmetry of our orbitals to then figure out whether we have uh, a non-zero oscillator strength from the orbital component. So this is for orbitals. Oops. And so this is, again, this is for mu. And then this is for psi of our ground state. This is for psi of our excited state. So we're using symmetry to abbreviate for these to kind of get a sense for whether uh, something is allowed or not. So non-zero integral means that it's allowed by orbital selection rules. OK, so that's our orbital component. So this is part one. Uh, for the spin component, the electrodipole moment operator does not operate on spin. So for spin, what we need is basically that the uh, psi spin of the ground state of the ground state um, times the of excited state, right? This is going to be this is basically the integral because there's no, the like I said the mu electrodipole moment operator does not operate on spin, and then so uh, we want to just keep keep spin conserved. Spin must be conserved for this to be spin allowed. Um, so this is orbital symmetry allowed. This is spin allowed. OK. And then uh, vibrational, again, we, we don't usually worry about. So these are the kind of key points here for selection rules. We'll talk a little bit about vibrational uh, like contributions later. Um, anyway, let me erase this, and we'll kind of summarize quickly. Okay, so selection rules. So rule one, oops, let me write this down. Okay, this is spin selection rule. Oops. Spin selection rule. So spin allowed transitions, um, to, be, to be spin allowed, your excited state and the ground state have to be the same spin. So we showed this before in our D2 and D8 examples where we went from triplet ground states the triplet excited states. OK. And the second one is called the parity selection rule. You, must, you might also see this as the Laporte selection rule. And this is the orbital symmetry selection rule. So basically, again, this is that we want the symmetry, orbital symmetry of our ground state, the direct product of that times 
gamma x, y, z, which is the symmetry of the electric dipole moment operator, times the symmetry of our excited state. And there has to be a, a totally symmetric representation as a component of that final reduced um, sum of your newspaper representations. OK, and then lastly, the last selection rule is uh, there's a one electron uh, selection rule. One electron selection rule, just meaning that one electron transitions are more intense than two electron transitions. So for example, in a D2 example where we have two electrons in the T2G orbitals in the ground state, uh, going to W occupied EG is a two electron transition, and so that's going to be less intense than the one electron transition where you go to T2G1, EG1. Okay, so these are our general rules. Um, they're kind of this general trend uh, for your intensities. So here are some trends. Okay, so if we think about the types of, oops, this is running out of ink. Okay, okay. so trends. Yeah, I'll use a different color. All right, so we have different epsilons. We have different oscillator strengths. And then we also have uh, kind of like band shapes, which we'll talk about in our next lecture. OK. So let's think about what happens if we have a DD transition. Um, let's say it's spin forbidden. So we're not maintaining spin, so it's going to be weak. And then if it's going to be, let's see, in the octahedral uh, symmetry. So um, let's, let's talk about what that will look like. So octahedral geometry, your ground states are always G in symmetry. So for example, uh, if we have, let me do a quick example. If we have D2 in octahedral, um, so let's say we're going from triplet T1G to triplet T2G to find whether we, uh, so this, this, first of all, this is a spin, spin allowed. So this is not quite this scenario. But let's look at the parity selection rule. So we want to take the ground state. So this will be the gamma of T1G, um, or the ground state, sorry. Ugh. OK, gamma of our ground state times gamma x, y, z. So again, in octahedral, times the gamma of excited state. So this is going to be equal to T1G cross T1U. So this is x, y, z in octahedral times T2G. And then so this cannot be A1G because a G times a U, this is a U, okay, times a G, it's got to be a U symmetry. So there cannot be A1G in this. So what this means is that in octahedral, all DD transitions are forbidden. Are parity forbidden. In tetrahedral, where we no longer have the inversion center, we don't have to worry about the G or the U. So in tetrahedral, we can have parity allowed transitions. And so we can have A1 geometry. Um, another factor of the Laporte selection rule uh, so is that DD transitions are always weak. So DD are weak because even when you have a molecular geometry, our D orbitals are symmetric with respect to the inversion. So D orbitals are always G in symmetry. Um, so uh, because of that, uh, they're, they're still forbidden because of this electric, di electric dipole moment operator. You can go from a d orbital to a p orbital, no problem. That's, that's loud and very intense. But to go from d to d, uh, p to p, or s to s is not allowed. OK, so that's our example. So for d to d and octahedral, it's parity forbidden. Parity forbidden. And then it's also spin forbidden. So this is going to be a really, really weak transition. So we might get epsilons of 0 0.1. And our oscillator, uh, our f is going to be 10 to the minus 9. Is that right? 10 to the minus 7, excuse me. And then uh, in this case, we'll talk about y later, but this would be maybe sharper. And then as we go down to more intense transitions, that'll be broader. OK. So 
Our second possibility is, let's say we have, sorry, I'm going to draw this line here. So if it's DD, so let's say it's been forbidden, but let's say it's tetrahedral, so this is parity allowed. then it'll be more intense. So this will be maybe like 10 times more. So this will be 1, 10 to the minus 6. Let's say if we're now getting to spin allowed transitions, so dd, spin allowed. So let's say we're, we're now going to this example, triplet to triplet, but we're still in octahedral. In octahedral, we might get tenfold more. So the spin selection rule has kind of a bigger effect. So there's 10, maybe 10 to the minus 5. OK, um, and then let's see. Oh, so next it would be DD spin allowed tetrahedral. So this would be parity allowed. Octahedral is parity forbidden. So we might get to, let's say, 100. And this would be 10 to the maybe minus 4, maybe. OK, so those are all our DD ones. But as you can see, they're still rather weak. We're going from 0.1 to 100. So in comparison, if we think about like a charge transfer transition, like LMCT, MLCT, we're going from D orbitals to P orbitals, for example, or P to D, and that's no longer Laporte forbidden. So because it's going to be, let's say if it's spin allowed and parity allowed, is that cut off? No, it's not cut off. Then we can get uh, epsilons on the order of like 10,000. And then also your strengths are like 10 to the minus 1. And of course, these are much broader. So these are more intense. So again, selection rules, spin and orbital, have a big effect on how your peaks look and how intensely they absorb. OK, so next class we'll do what governs band shape.